Welcome back to the channel. This is Trendy Storm, and you are watching 11th part of What If Naruto Mastered Ancient Shinobi Way. If you enjoy this video, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Now, wasting no more time, let's start the story. Are you all right, Subaki Chan? I can see that many of your clansmen are incapacitated, but your uncle's behavior perplexes me. What happened? Hanada asked, her Byakugan activated. While Kiro writhed on the ground in agony, Hanada brought green glowing palms over Tsubaki's legs and wrists to mend the muscles and tendons she had severed. We were about to come and help you when we were ambushed by a single Anbu, Tsubaki explained, and he seemed to be able to defend himself from any side, rendering all our tactics useless. Go on, Hanada reasoned, he must have been a sensor type. We began to turn the tides of the battle by using some of my clansmen as distraction while I attacked, Hanada nodded as she listened, but it was a trap, Hanada nodded as she listened, he wanted me to get in close, and as I did, Kiro Oji-san, suddenly began knocking out the squad causing us to lose our focus on the Anbu, and the next thing I knew he did a jutsu I saw my body help my uncle and the Anbu subdue the rest of my clansmen. I see, you shouldn't feel bad, you were up against a Yamanaka, and that technique he used was Shintenshin no Jutsu, she said before looking down at Kiro, your betrayal, Reizoku Kiro, has been exposed, what do you have to say for yourself? The black scythe should have been mine, he wailed. You betrayed not only our clan and village, but also Uzumaki-sama? Forgive me, Hanada-sama, I have spoken out of turn, Tsubaki said, then bowed deeply to Hanada as she realized what she had done. It's okay, Tsubaki, she said as she looked into the distance with her Byakugan, Naruto-kun is almost done fighting, we should go meet him. Are you going to murder me? Kiro let out a groan. That wound I inflicted will kill you, slowly and painfully, Hinata said, her beautiful features marred by a frown, and power is the worst reason to betray those who trust you, and as head of the assassination squad, this shall be your sentence to die a slow agonizing death here alone in the woods. He had not anticipated such a harsh sentence. Kiro had always thought it was foolish of the clan head to swear the clan's loyalty to a young ninja. A child in his eyes and his girlfriend. Naruto appeared carefree and easygoing. He noticed that he was firmly rooted in the fundamentals, but he never saw anything special in the boy or the girl that warranted a blood oath sworn to Naruto and Hanada's loyalty, servitude, and guardianship. He was also disappointed that he did not receive the Black Scythe, the clan's only item of importance and power. He was enraged that Tsubaki had been chosen to receive it, especially since he considered himself to be the strongest in the clan, but on the day she demonstrated why she deserved it, he couldn't go against the clan head, so he decided to get it another way and kill three birds with one stone. However, this plan has now proven to be foolish at best and suicidal at worst. He could see it now, because there was a chill in Hanada's eyes that could freeze the air. He also witnessed Tsubaki's ability to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with an Anbu-level ninja using only her ninjutsu. Hanada saw the regret in his eyes and decided to give him a second chance, similar to a ninja's mercy. I will give you one chance to atone, Kiro said, if you can get to my house before the sun rises, I will consider forgiving you. With that, Hanada and Tsubaki vanished in a blur, leaving Kiro to claw his way to the home of Uzumaki Naruto and the soon-to-be Uzumaki Hanada. Naruto defeated his opponent. The ANBU's body lay in a bloody puddle on the ground, with his head next to it. He turned away from his adversary and approached Akahoshi. He'd passed out from the pain and blood loss, but he'd live. That was perfectly fine with Naruto. He picked him up and tossed him over his shoulder before heading to the Reizoku to meet up with Hanada, hoping she had defeated the false Tsubaki. He was well aware that it was a forgery. The Reizoku was a stern ninja who had sworn a blood pact to protect himself and any descendants who bore his blood and name. Above all, Tsubaki was his shadow, 
chosen by the Reizoku clan head himself and bound to him at all times unless Naruto told him otherwise. Tsubaki's suggestion to leave Naruto's side raised a lot of red flags. Hanada and Tsubaki returned before Naruto could leave. Tsubaki's first reaction when she saw him was to prostrate herself at Naruto's feet. Please forgive me, Uzumaki-sama, she said, pressing her forehead to the grass, my skills have proven insufficient to protect Uzumaki-sama and vanquish his enemies, and as a result, Uzumaki-sama and Hanada-sama have been placed in danger. To atone, I will accept whatever punishment Uzumaki-sama deems appropriate. Naruto lowered his gaze to the prostrate woman. His face softened, and he kneeled in front of her, holding her chin with his fingers so she would look at him. I will not punish you for the actions of another, Tsubaki, Naruto said as he stood up and helped Tsubaki to her feet, you are my most trusted subordinate and confidant. If your abilities were insufficient, I would not have you on this team or as my personal guard. Come on, we still have a lot to do. Thank you, Uzumaki-sama, she said, as stoic as ever, but with a small smile on her lips this time. Shigur at 2 a. M. Shigur looked at the eight men, seven of whom were wearing masks, two of whom were unable to fight because they had intercepted a strike for Danzo, and the eighth was Danzo himself. The remaining five Anbu surrounded her, and she watched them with a cold calculating eye. Two took positions in front of her, two in back, and a fifth circled for any other openings, and as one they pounced like hungry dogs on helpless prey, but Shigur was anything but helpless. Shigura's short sword, which she extended with her chakra, blocked the two coming from her front with drawn swords. The two from her back attacked with swords as well, but were stunned when a plume of pink chakra feathers sprouted from her tailbone. They were stunned for only a fraction of a second before continuing their assault. They were stopped dead in their tracks, however, when the plume of chakra stopped their sword strikes like a steel wall. When the two who were blocked by Shigur's sword saw that their partners were failing in the rear, they used their combined strength to push her back and into position for the fifth member to immediately kill her. The two members at her back, realizing she could use her chakra plumes to block and possibly kill him, attacked her back again and were stopped by her chakra plumes. Instead of retreating, they pressed their attack in the hopes of keeping her bound and exposed. When the fifth ninja saw the opening, he jumped at it, only to be surprised by a seven-foot red panda with long fangs and six-inch claws. Shigur pushed back with her chakra plumes and created chakra lances from her sword, forcing the two in front of her to leap back. When the two in front of her jumped back, she spun around and extended her sword further, narrowly catching the two behind her across the cheek. Four of the ninja were pushed back, and the fifth was clutching at five deep gashes on his chest. He could still fight, but he might be of little help to his comrades. Coco, the red panda, saw the opportunity and charged at the one he had injured. The others chose to ignore it and go straight for the kill. However, they underestimated the bear, and two of them were forced to abandon their initial plans in order to concentrate on the bear. Shigur, Seeing two of the men following her, flashed through a quick set of seals, ending on the Tori seal. Kujaku Miyoho, Kimono, Kujaku Miyoho. Her chakra plumes twisted and contorted themselves into a twisted mockery of a bear as she said this. The last two were attacked by the chakra construct. She noticed Danzo still trying to open the last seal, despite the fact that all of her opponents were either down or busy. She sat cross-legged and brought her hands in the Tori seal, beginning a silent chant that even though it was silent, carried off into the distances as her hair flew wildly as if blown by a phantom wind, not willing to give him time to finish whatever he started, but knowing that Coco and her chakra construct would not be able to hold off the Anbu for long. As she chanted, pink butterflies began to fill the clearing and surround the enemies one by one, and when she finished her chant by saying, devour my enemies, savor each bite, the pink butterflies swarmed the Anbu. 
The Anbu were caught off guard and surprised when they noticed the seemingly insignificant insects tearing into their clothes, armor, and then flesh. They frantically tried to swat and crush the insects, but it was futile. The insects ravaged their bodies in seconds, just like a swarm of locusts would a field of crops. Danzo attempted a jutsu after finally removing the seals from his arms, but he was too late. The butterflies had already landed on him, and he, like his men, was quickly reduced to nothing. When she saw her foe defeated, she cancelled both of her jutsu, causing the beast to disperse and reform into chakra plumes and the butterflies to disperse from where they came. Her eyes widened as a sword pierced through her chest as she sheathed her sword and removed her chakra from Coco. When she turned around, she saw the old warhawk's wrinkled face, and the bandages over his left eye were removed, revealing a Sharingan. He drew the blade and watched her stumble forward. Amazing, he said, clutching the hole, I was aiming for your heart, but it appears you have a high resistance to Genjutsu, even this Sharingan couldn't fool you for more than a few seconds. It's no surprise you were sent to kill me. Your Jutsu and style are unlike any other ninja. Danzo approached her, and that's when she noticed it. His right arm was covered in Sharingan from the palm of his hand to his shoulder, and as she watched, she noticed that one was closed. Shigur had never faced a Sharingan before, but she had heard about it from Naruto's briefing of all his dragons and department heads. So she knew she was at a severe disadvantage unless she could distract him and remove the arm. It would be easier to remove than the one in his head because appendages are easier to remove than heads. Naruto assigned her a task, and if she did not complete it completely, she would make it easier for whoever came after her. Danzo raised his left hand to finish off the downed Kunoichi when spikes from the sword's handle impaled him in the hand, causing him to drop the weapon and look around. He identified the perpetrator as Kumori Mataza. This was not the worst of Danzo's problems. The seemingly unconscious and bleeding Shigur suddenly lunged up and slashed cleanly through his right arm with her chakra blazing sword. The wound did not bleed, but that did not make it any less painful. The slash had cauterized the wound. As this happened, Danzo leapt away and looked at the two. Shigur was down but not out, but with that lung wound, she needed immediate medical attention. It appears you, whoever you are, are at a disadvantage, Danzo said. Of course, Danzo knew who he was based on the manipulation of metal, so he gambled. Shigur was injured and unable to fight, and if Naruto was anything like the gentle Sandame, he would rather keep Shigur safe than pursue Danzo. Danzo frowned as Mataza performed a few hand seals, causing spikes to protrude from the ground and secure the Sharingan impregnated arm to the ground, but smiled as Mataza assumed a protective stance over the girl. For the time being, it appears that he will be able to do nothing but flee, but in this case, he could not hope for more. The fool, he thought to himself as he pulled out a smoke bomb. You are a grotesque individual, and I would love to end your existence on this planet, but I am unwilling to jeopardize my friend's life, and you appear to be at a severe disadvantage. Danzo got the hint and didn't need to be told twice, so he threw down the smoke bomb, and when the smoke cleared, he was gone, leaving nothing but the arm that was pinned to the ground. What is the current situation, Hanada-chan? Hanada nodded and then silently activated her by a Kugan, remaining silent for a few seconds as if staring off into the great beyond. She was, in fact, able to see farther than any other Byakugan user had ever been able to. There appears to be some commotion at the hospital, someone is currently on their way here now, Hanada continued, currently there is a standoff at the tower, by the looks of it Riku is waiting on your approval. My department has already routed the remaining traders who attempted to secure the remaining important infrastructure such as the hospital and the ninja exclusive zone, and Kai's department is hunting whoever managed to escape. Naruto was about to express his relief that no one had been seriously injured and that the operation had gone well when Hanada raised her hand to stop him. 
Her face was filled with concern. What's the problem, Hanada-chan? Naruto inquired. This is Shigur, she explained. Her mission was to eliminate Danzo. How is that going? Not so good, she said. It appears that Danzo has a bigger trick up his sleeve than we thought. If this continues, Shigur. Wait, Shigur is down. Naruto quickly picked up the overcoat and turned to meet Shigur as soon as possible. Naruto had great faith in Shigur's abilities. While she was not yet at her peak, the nature of her bloodline guaranteed her the ability to summon an army, perform jutsu unheard of, and her chakra was deadly to all but herself and Koko, and with Koko by her side, she had a partner. This made her the best ace Naruto could have hoped for. She was unassuming, and few were aware of the extent of her abilities. However, sending her alone after someone like Danzo appeared to be a mistake. Where have they gone? He inquired. Hanada turned and gave him the exact distance by pointing in a direction. Be careful, Itenpai, Mataza has arrived on the scene, but she is fading quickly, get her to the hospital quickly and I will take care of the rest, she warned. His left eye and right arm seem strange, as if they don't belong to him, whatever he had hidden there may have been the cause of Shigur's defeat, she added. Alright, Tsubaki, let's go. Naruto and Tsubaki took off so quickly that they appeared to blur out of sight. Hanada switched off her Bakugan and walked back into the house, reappearing a few minutes later in a Hakama and Monsuki kimono. She then dragged Akahoshi, who had already passed out from blood loss judging by the collar of his clothing, towards the tower. When she arrived, Riku and four shinobi were holding Naruto's secretary and other staff hostage. How are you all doing tonight? She inquired. When they heard her soft voice, the ninja smirked, but paled when they saw not only that she wasn't smiling, but also the state of Akahoshi as she dumped him on the floor before him. You think you're tough, girl, the ringleader said, but we've got an ace up our sleeve. Oh, really? She asked, approaching them slowly like a hungry predator. They didn't know why, but the closer she got, the more terrified they became. With each step, their heart beat faster, and they couldn't figure it out. She was shorter, thinner, and far too adorable to strike fear into the hearts of four, five if Riku was counted, grown men. They were unaware that she was using a passive technique on them. There was no chakra or killing intent, it was simply a forgotten skill used by the ninja of old to strike fear into the hearts of enemies, nothing more than a specific way of speaking, acting, and behaving with a few specific body gestures. It was the ability to instill fear, which Master Kiyosh had taught her, Naruto, and Akira. I find that difficult to believe, especially with you standing so close to Riku, she said. She kept walking towards them, and Riku was having trouble convincing himself that he shouldn't be concerned because he was on her side. But, try as he might, he hadn't felt this much fear in years. They were all terrified, so terrified that when she was within arm's reach, they all froze. She reached out a hand to Riku's shoulder and moved him out of the way so she could face the four traitors and place a hand on the one who spoke chest. I recognize you, she said, you're the one who is always with Akahoshi, right? He couldn't help but nod. I see, then you might get to live, they all sighed, only to break out in cold sweat again when they heard her laugh. Sillies, she said, I only said he'd live. Hanada struck each of their hearts with lightning speed before the other three could react. There was no sound and only minor wind shifts. All Akahoshi's assistant could hear were the bodies of his three allies falling to the ground. He turned to Riku in terror. Riku, please stop her, he begged, only to realize what Riku was doing, you bastard, you betrayed us. 
Did you not tell him, Riku? Hanada stated as Riku freed all of the hostages. Riku gave a nod. Forgive me, Hanada-sama, but they had already taken hostages when I arrived, and I feared the worst, so I kept my true motives hidden until someone else who knew the truth showed up. I was prepared to deal with the situation if it continued. I see, she said, striking a few points on Akahoshi's assistant before handing him over to Riku. Riku was never working with traitors like you, he is one of the most loyal shinobi in this village. Take him and Akahoshi to a special holding cell and make sure they don't sleep. I'll need as much information as possible from them. Yes, Hanada-sama, he said, turning to Hanada and asking, how is Kanshisha-sama? Shiguru ran into some problems, so he went to bring her back, she explained as flower petals swirled around her, I am heading to the hospital now, if you see Kai, tell him to wait at the gate for Naruto's return, and tell him there is a very important target that must be caught at all costs. As you wish, Riku said as Hanada walked away. Mataza kept a close eye on his surroundings as the smoke cleared to ensure that Danzo was indeed gone. He turned to Shigur, who had Coco sitting next to her, satisfied that they were alone. He picked her up in the bridal style while Coco climbed onto his shoulders, but just as he was about to leave, he felt someone land in the clearing. He didn't notice the person until the last second, but he was relieved to see it was Naruto and Tsubaki. How wonderful to see you, Kanshisha! He exclaimed. No time for pleasantries. We need to get her back to Arashi as soon as possible, he said, motioning for her to stand next to him. After saying this, Tsubaki and Mataza stood next to Naruto, and the ground beneath them began to ripple, and a portal opened up beneath them, allowing them to slowly descend into the portal, only to re-emerge from the ground moments later in front of the hospital, where Hanada and a few of the medical staff awaited. Was that your Kanshisha Cage Sama's Sochi no Jutsu? Mataza inquired. Yes, now I need you to find Kai and arrange for him to meet me at the gate. Hanada's voice stopped him as he was about to take off again. He should already be there, Naruto-kun, Hanada said as he followed the medical staff inside. I figured you'd want to follow Danzo, so I had Riku deliver a message to wait for you at the gate. I see, he smiled, you really know me like no one else. They went their separate ways after that. Naruto was the first to arrive at the gate, followed by Kai, who bowed on the one known before Naruto. What do you require, Naruto? Danzo managed to escape, but not without injuring Shigur in battle, Naruto explained. Not only does he have information on this village that I cannot under any circumstances allow him to be free with, but if he escapes, he may get away with undermining the Hokage's authority, and the Hokage wants him dead. I'll start tracking him now, he said, but a strong hand gripped his shoulder, preventing him from taking another step. Hold on, we're all going together, Naruto said, and I'll take you to where he was last seen. Naruto then used the Cage Sochi no Jutsu to transport them to the scene of Shigur's fight. Mika had immediately begun work on Shigur after Naruto had left to capture Danzo. It was a difficult surgery, but everything was going well. Meanwhile, while Mika was operating on Shigur, Hanada found herself on one of the hospital's lower levels. She walked down a dimly lit corridor with doors on both sides. She came to a halt at the second door on the right. She took hold of the handle and pushed it open, revealing a completely bare, yet sterile room. She then shut the door, bit her finger to draw blood, and performed a series of hand seals. Kachiyose no jutsu, she said as she pressed her hands against the door, and the seal array encircled it before dissipating. She grasped the handle again and opened it, but instead of a barren room, there was a bed and some other items one would expect to find in a hospital room, including a patient. In this case, the patient was no longer sleeping. Instead, he sat at the foot of the bed, 
patiently waiting for someone to arrive. When the door opened, the patient was met with a pair of pale lavender eyes, followed by a warm smile. Ah, Itachi-san, it appears you are finally awake, Hanada said. How are you feeling? I'll survive, he assured them, your medics are quite skilled. Thank you, Hanada said, despite the fact that you and Sasuke had such a terrifying fight, with the exception of chakra exhaustion, neither of you had any life-threatening injuries. How about Sasuke? Itachi inquired. Hanada could tell he was still troubled by his transgressions, but there was something else bothering him, and she could tell by looking at him that he had more questions than just that. We've sedated him and placed a chakra suppressing seal on him in the room next to yours. We'll deliver him to Konoha tomorrow. I see, he said, a relieved expression on his face, as if years of worry had simply melted away, but it had been replaced by something else. I was skeptical when Naruto told me about you, but now that I've had the chance to speak with you in person and observe you for myself, I must admit, I was very wrong, Hanada said, continuing. I understand you have some questions you want answered, but I will wait until Naruto returns so that he can explain himself to you. She then turned around and left, leaving a change of clothes on the bed. Itachi half expected the door to close behind him, giving him the sensation of motion. However, he was pleasantly surprised when Hanada left it open and he heard the words, Kachiyose no Jutsu, spoken at the door next to him. He dressed and took a tentative step into the dimly lit corridor, only to find Hanada waiting for him at an open door similar to the one he stepped out of. He approached the open door and peered inside. The room was identical to the one he had just left, but when he looked on the bed, he saw his younger brother, Sasuke, sleeping peacefully. Itachi smiled as he brushed a lock of hair away from his face and walked back out of the room. You should smile more often, Itachi, it makes you look younger and less cold, Hanada said as she closed the door and exited the room, beckoning Itachi to follow her, you are to stay with me at all times and remain unnoticed at all times. Use the mask and hood that came with your new outfit to ensure that no one can identify you, at least for the time being. You'll be with Naruto-kun and me until further notice. What are you all doing? Is it to use me against Konoha or Akatsuki? Itachi inquired. Hanada only turned to look at him before turning back to continue walking. If that is the case, I believe I should inform you that I will not reveal any information about Konoha but I will freely reveal information about Akatsuki and the Uchiha on the condition that Sasuke be returned unharmed to Konoha. Itachi heard Hanada laugh after he said this. It wasn't a mocking laugh, but a genuine chuckle as she climbed some stairs. He couldn't understand why she found what he said amusing, but what she said next would not only change Itachi's perspective on the world, but also influence his decision to put his full trust in another person. You've seen the worst that the shinobi world has to offer, Itachi, and yet you still have more integrity and honor than any ninja, let alone any normal person, Hanada began, and good men like you don't always have to suffer. It's past time for you to see the brighter side of the shinobi world. I see, he said as Hanada held open a door at the top of the stairs for him to enter what Itachi would later refer to as his second life. After a few hours, Danzo had reached the end of his rope. He had tried everything, but because he had lost his Sharingan-covered arm at the shoulder, he could no longer perform ninjutsu, use any of the Sharingan's high-level genjutsu, or use Mokaton jutsu. He may have heard the phrase, don't put all your eggs in one basket, but those who surround themselves with their own philosophies forget that no single person is ever all-powerful. But that doesn't mean he'll simply give up. On the contrary. He had no doubt that if he gave up, he would be executed. If he ran back to Konoha, he'd have to come up with a good excuse for why he was in such bad shape, especially since he was retired and no one knew he was leaving. His only hope was to escape to an unallied country, hoping that his pursuers would not follow, 
and then quietly returned to his beloved Konoha. Unfortunately, one of his past blunders was currently biting him in the behind. He had only three pursuers, Uzumaki Naruto, his left hand Tsubaki, and someone he thought he had gotten rid of, Uchiha Kai. While he was aware that Kai was opposed to the coup, Danzo did not trust any of the Uchiha, whether out of jealousy or for other reasons, and thus aided in keeping him a wanted man by all nations. Unfortunately, Naruto took him in, and it appears that he learned more than just a few things about tracking. Perhaps things were looking up when he came across a camp and the inhabitants looked at him with wide eyes. What went wrong with you, old man? The one with the rose pink hair inquired. Please assist me, Danzo said, I recently escaped from captivity, but my escape was not clean. I lost my comrades and barely made it out alive. I wouldn't say that, old man, Suigetsu replied, looking over his shoulder, it appears you left a piece back there. Shut up, Suigetsu, Karen reprimanded before returning her attention to the elderly man, I'm a medic, perhaps I can help. The elderly gentleman nodded and allowed Karen to examine his shoulder. Her eyes widened as she removed the bandages and looked at the wound. What type of weapon did this? She inquired. Is it bad? He inquired. No, it's just that whatever cut off your arm also cauterized it, and I can even sense a strange chakra coming from it. I see, he said, feigning relief that wasn't entirely phony, can I have some weapons and some food if it's not too much trouble? I won't stay long because I'm afraid my pursuers will associate you with me. Karen was seriously considering assisting the old man at this point. After all, he was just a defenseless old man with one eye and one arm. He couldn't possibly cause any harm to anyone. Akira emerged from the tent just as she was about to suggest this to her group. What the hell do you think you're doing assisting an elderly stranger on the run in the middle of the night? It's not that I don't care, Karen defended, but it would be better for all of us if he could leave here sooner. And what does it matter what the idiot does? Your precious little brother Uzumaki Naruto won't let any harm come to you, Suigetsu said as Akira walked over to the man and took a critical look at him while Karen glared at her. Only his years of training and conditioning kept him from smirking at this piece of information. It was time for a change of plans. How fortunate could a man be to walk into a camp where his adversary's sister was spending the night? All he needed now was an opening, which he got when Akira turned her attention away from him to address Suigetsu. Akira paused her examination of the elderly man and smiled broadly at Suigetsu. That is true, she admitted, but... That's all she could say when she found herself in an iron grip with a kanai around her neck. Don't move, any of you, Danzo demanded, it's a good thing I ran into you. You better let her go if you want to keep your other arm, Suigetsu demanded as he prepared his zanbato. Don't be a fool, boy, Danzo warned. I happen to know Naruto, and he has no siblings, but if she's that close to him, you wouldn't want to be at his mercy if he realizes you were the cause of his her death. He was correct. Suigetsu had not seen many of his fights, but he was certain that even with his talent, he could not defeat Naruto in a fight. Furthermore, if the old fool killed her, he would never find the village and thus would not be able to obtain the swords. So, reluctantly, he put down the blade. Good, Danzo said, my pursuers will be here in a few moments, and you three will assist me. However, before he could do anything else, three ninja appeared on the branches surrounding Danzo and the four teenagers. It appears you have caught up with me yet again, Danzo said calmly. For a man about to die, you appear rather calm, Danzo, Naruto said, nodding to Tsubaki, who was preparing her bow, there isn't much you can do Danzo, come peacefully and Tsunade no Bon might go easy on you for your treachery. You'd know quite a bit about treachery, 
Especially with that traitorous Hyuga bitch of yours, Danzo said, pleased when Naruto's face twisted in disgust. That was a huge mistake, Danzo. Not only do you insult her, but you also hide behind hostages, Naruto said. This is no mere hostage, he said coolly, turning to face Naruto. This is someone who happened to be quite close to you. For several moments, Naruto looked at the person being held hostage by Danzo. Do I know you miss? He inquired. With the exception of Kai and Tsubaki, everyone, including Danzo, began to sweat. Are you telling me that this bitch lied to us about being Naruto's sister the whole time? Suigetsu questioned Karen angrily. A tick mark appeared on Akira's face, and he began to yell at Naruto despite the situation. What the hell do you mean, do I know you miss? She screamed before calmly continuing, to think, little Naruto-kun has already gone senile after only one year and forgotten his favorite sister who saved his life from certain death. Naruto took another look at the girl at this point, and recognition hit him. Tsubaki looked at Naruto as he laughed nervously, as she had never seen him act like that before. Sorry, Akira Ne, you change your appearance so frequently that I didn't recognize you, Naruto apologized sheepishly, adding as an afterthought, and you're my only sister. You should be ashamed for forgetting your Oni-chan, Akira countered. Naruto took offense at this. What do you mean, I should be ashamed? He retorted, what would Master Kiyosh say if he saw you being a one-handed and one-eyed old man? A Senbon flew out of the darkness of the forest, intent on impaling Donzo's other shoulder and rendering the other arm useless. However, no one reached his age without being skilled. He had no choice but to abandon his hostage as he sensed the weapon approaching. He would have killed her just to annoy Naruto, but that would have taken precious seconds away from him. However, this was not to be. As he attempted to leap away from his hostage, the girl grabbed him in a vice-like grip, and a hand erupted from the ground, grabbing him by the ankle and dragging him and the girl underground. They saw Danzo flinch several times while they were both buried to their necks before another person erupted from the ground a few feet away. When the girl's head, which was also buried to her neck, crumbled to stone, Donzo's eye opened for a few seconds before returning to its neutral position. You were always on guard, Danzo praised, so when I moved to capture you, all you had to do was kawari me with a suchi bunshin and wait for the right opportunity to use the doden, shunju zanshu no jutsu. However, Jugo's face twisted as he said this, and markings began to spread across his body. When Naruto noticed this, he used his speed to appear behind him. Do not be foolish, Jugo, Naruto said in his ear, leaking his murderous intent. Unfortunately, Jugo simply turned around and attempted to backhand Naruto with a meaty appendage contorted to look like a hammer. When Naruto saw the strike coming, he ducked beneath it and delivered a powerful strike to Jugo's midsection, knocking him out. Jugo quickly stood up and was about to charge again when his face twisted in fear and he quickly reverted to his human form. Naruto moved quickly behind him and knocked him out. When he looked around, he noticed an unconscious Danzo with his head sticking out of the ground and Kai standing nearby. Didn't he use that genjutsu again? Naruto inquired. Yes, Kai confirmed, and I believe I know whose eye it was. Shisui had it because he was the only Uchiha with such skill with his Sharingan. I see, we'll have to remove it when we get back, Naruto said, turning to face Akira, but I'm curious why he didn't try to escape. Even in that state, he could easily escape from that situation. That's because I put some Senbon in his pressure points when I pulled him down, Akira explained with a grin, and he couldn't move even if he had both arms. Naruto approached Jugo Karen and Suigetsu. Congratulations on making it this far, Naruto said, but before either of them could respond, he continued, 
but I said to seek out the storm village. Because this is not the storm village, you still have a long way to go. Be nice, Naruto-kun, they've been through a lot, Akira said, and I can personally vouch for the girl in the giant, shark boy over there is still confused, but he has goodness in him. Naruto considered it for a moment before nodding. Very well, he said, I guess I can take you all with me and skip the rest of your test because Akira Ne gave you all such good reviews. Thank you, Karen said, but Naruto interrupted her with a handshake. Do not thank me yet, he said as he locked his gaze on them, because you're here, I assume you've all made a decision. Tell me, Karen, what you've decided. Tsubaki and Kai joined Akira at Naruto's side. Karen was strangely intimidated by the group, not only by the four's share of chakra, but also by Naruto's fierce piercing gaze and regal samurai poise. She moved forward, her cheeks heating up as she looked into his eyes. She knelt on one knee and averted her gaze. I have decided that I am tired of just being used. Was all she got before Naruto stopped her. Do not look away from me, he said, I want to see the sincerity in your eyes, if there is any. I'm sorry, she said, raising her head, I'm tired of being used. I'm a strong Kunoichi who wants a leader who is not only strong, but also loyal. I long for a place to live. Naruto grinned. I see, he admitted, but how about you, Jugo? Jugo, like Karen, went on his knee. All my life I've been a coward. I willingly gave myself to Orochimaru so that the beast within me could be tamed, he continued, but I can't go on knowing that it might one day take control of me. I'm afraid of myself, and I beg you to show me the way out so that I don't have to live with this fear. You've already taken the first step, Jugo, Naruto said before turning to Suigetsu, so, Suigetsu, what have you decided? All I want are the seven swords of the Swordsman of the Mist, he stated bluntly, but I am willing to earn them if necessary, one way or another. Suigetsu took an unintentional step back as Naruto gave him a feral smile. You are quite adept at concealing your true self through murder and violence, Suigetsu, Naruto observed, but I admire your candor. In many ways, Zabuza was similar to you. Suigetsu was perplexed by this. He'd heard how much like Zabuza he was many times before, but they were always commenting on his violence. But now someone was implying that Zabuza was more than the cold-blooded murderer that everyone thought he was. Kai whispered in Naruto's ear as this passed through his mind. Are you sure what you're doing, Naruto-sama? This boy clearly threatened you, he inquired. I appreciate your concern, Kai, Naruto reassured, but he's more than a murderer. Zabuza was the same way. Kai and Suigetsu were both taken aback by this. You all made a decision today. Are you willing to come with me and become a storm ninja? They were all nodding. Then arise you three, allow me to introduce myself, he cleared his throat, I am Uzumaki Naruto, son of Konoha's Yandaimi Hokage, Namikaze Minato and Uzumaki Kashina of the Uzumaki clan. Jinchuriki of Kayubi no Kitsune and Shodai Kanshisha of Arashigakir no Sado, they bowed once more in recognition of his position and Naruto turned to his sister, smiled, and grabbed her in a bone-crushing grip. It's great to see you again, Akira Ne, said Naruto, the council was really putting pressure on me to find a permanent captain for the intelligence department. What do you think? What, me? She exclaimed, surprised, but I won't know what to do as a leader. When we get back to the village, he yawned, we'll talk about all of that after I get some sleep. He then returned his attention to Karen, Suigetsu, and Jugo. You are not an official Arashi ninja yet, but as your first duty, dig him out, he said, pointing over his shoulder to Donzo's head poking out of the ground. 
You can leave that to me, Akira said. She made a hand seal, which caused a circular crack to form around his head. She then stamped her foot on the ground, causing a cylinder of earth holding Danzo to spring out of the ground and crumble, leaving Danzo unconscious on the ground with Senbon sticking out all over his body. Kai then approached him and gently tossed him over his shoulder. All right, everyone, gather close to me, Naruto said, Cage Sochi no Jutsu. The ground beneath their feet rippled as a result, and they all sank into it. But Akira had something to say before they all vanished. Have you and Hanada finished it yet, Naruto-kun? Oni-chan, Akira. Whoa, that felt strange, Suigetsu said as the group emerged from the ground in front of Arashi's gates. Both Karen and Jugo nodded in agreement as he said this, but they were quickly put on guard when a group of ninja appeared around them, but they were put at ease when they bowed to Naruto. Welcome back, Kanshisha-sama, one of them said, I hope your business was a success? Of course, Naruto said cheerfully, pointing over his shoulder to Kai, who was carrying an unconscious Danzo, who resembled a pincushion on his shoulder. They nodded and returned to their post after seeing the unconscious elder. Naruto then continued on his way to the hospital. Master would be proud that you remembered and put into practice his teachings on visible and invisible security, Akira inquired. He would be pleased to see how much you have accomplished in such a short period of time. Did you have any reservations? Naruto inquired sarcastically. Naruto and the others arrived at the hospital after a few more minutes of walking. Kai, take our Karen, Jugo, and Suigetsu to level 0 holding, and I'll deal with that piece of trash, he says, pointing to the unconscious Danzo. Holding? I'm not going to be a prisoner again, Suigetsu said as he reached for his weapon. You betrayed us, Karen said. You promised to help us and invite us to your village. I'm not going to work for you. Naruto looked to Jugo, who then turned to Suigetsu and placed a hand on Suigetsu. What exactly is it, Jugo? We must keep in mind that we are still strangers in this village, Jugo said, and if we want to join, we must follow their rules. Suigetsu let go of his weapon and let Kai lead them away with a huff. Naruto walked into the hospital with Danzo now on his shoulders, flanked by Akira and Tsubaki. As they walked in, they noticed Hinata standing in front of a wall, staring at a chart, with a tall hooded figure standing beside her. Akira's face brightened when he saw this. She crept up behind the girl quietly, not making a sound or disturbing the wind, and pounced when she was in the right position. Hanada stood in the hospital lobby, staring at a chart that Mika had put up, scheduling treatments for that day. Though it was a bloodless counter-coup, many Reizoku members who were ambushed by the mind-stealing root Anbu were injured. None of it was life-threatening, but neither is a simple cut that could become infected and very dangerous. The sun would rise in an hour or so, and the day would begin, and it would take the entire day to treat everyone and anyone who needed it. Hanada was content with the fact that things were improving. All she had to do now was wait for Naruto to return. But, just as she was thinking about him, she felt a predator slowly stalking her, waiting for its first opportunity to take her. She looked over at the man next to her and noticed he didn't seem to be as terrified as she was. She felt it all at once, first as a warm sensation around her waist and then as a cool breeze across her ear. She wished she could turn around and fight this threat. And what a threat it was. There had only been one person in her life who could give her this sense of dread that froze her on the spot and rendered her helpless. But that was impossible because that person was training on a hidden mountain under Master Kiyosha's tutelage. There was no way she could have completed his training and passed the exam. It would only have taken two years on the mountain. But then she heard something that dispelled all her doubts. 
Slowly, a firm yet beautiful feminine voice spoke into her ear. I heard you and Naruto-kun fight every night like wild animals, and he can't get enough of those huge knockers of yours. She spun around, a shade of red she hadn't seen in years, and met the grinning face of the only person who would say something like that. Hanada's face contorted into a shocked expression, followed by a joyful expression that could only be expressed when meeting someone dear to you after a long absence. Her embarrassment gone, she snatched the smiling girl in a bear hug. I've missed you so much, Akira Oni-chan, Hanada said as Akira returned the hug. How are you doing? How did you come across us? Was your trip safe? Have you ever met Naruto-kun? Will you be staying? Is Master all right? When? Akira clamped her fingers around Hinata's lips, preventing her from continuing her barrage of questions. Relax, Hinata-chan, I'm not going anywhere. You can ask me any questions you want, she said, releasing Hinata's lips as Naruto and Tsubaki approached the girls, only to see Akira suddenly change to something more solemn, and about Master. How about you, Master? Is he okay? Demanded Naruto. He doesn't have much longer to live, she said, and we three must return in three days to hear his final words. Naruto, like Hanada, became solemn. Understood, he replied, but for now, I need Hanada to make sure this fool doesn't die on us while I prepare his accommodations. Naruto then handed Danzo over to Hanada, who motioned for the hooded figure and Akira to follow her. Danzo would be treated before being placed in the highest level of holding and restraining method. The highest level of holding was the same rooms Itachi and Sasuke were kept in. A multi-purpose prison capable of holding the most dangerous person or item while also keeping them safe. A prison from which there is no way out. In the council chamber two days later. Naruto found himself sitting in the council chamber on a seat reserved for him two days after the attempted coup. But, come to think of it, all of the seats in the council chamber were specially reserved because only ten seats and one extra were required. The seats were all arranged around an open circular table with a gap that allowed a person to walk to the center, which was sunken into the floor and held another, less comfortable chair. The Kanshisha sat in a chair that was taller and more decorated than the others, directly opposite the gap. Shibuki and Megan Tosuke, his counselors, were to his right, followed by Hagen Riku, the head of the Juryu no Arashi, and Mika, the head of the medical department. Fuma Hanzaki, the counselor, was to the left of the Kanshisha, followed by Jonin Commander Tsubaki, the head of the assassination department, Hayuga Hanada, the head of the hunter department, Kuga Kai, and an empty seat reserved for the head of the intelligence department. This was referred to as the Supreme Assembly. Five figures sat in the center, dressed in simple hooded robes to conceal their identities. Fuma Hanzaki rose to begin the meeting. The last time we all gathered like this, it was to judge the now captain of the hunter department Kuga Kai when he joined our great village in Ichika Hotaru, formerly of Iwa, he began, but today we are here to judge not just two, but five potential storm ninja. Who will be the first to be judged? Shibuki stood up at this point. Karen, come forth and present yourself. Yelled Shibuki. Karen stood up and removed her hood. She was nervous to say the least. The entire room was dark except for where she and the other four sat, so she couldn't see who was calling her, only their direction. She could sense many high-level chakras, one of which could only be Naruto's, and the sheer amount of it this close to the source, blinded her to all other chakras. Naruto continued at this point. Did anyone invite you to this village? Speak their name, he inquired, to which Karen nodded. Yu Uzumaki Naruto, Kanshisha of this village, she introduced herself. Very well, and why are you here? 
he inquired. Karen began to perspire as she sensed the accusing gazes of those around her, even though she couldn't see them. I'm here to learn and understand the value of having a true family and comrades, and to grow stronger. Basically, I want a life that is stable for me. What talent do you have that could benefit this great village? Shibuki came after. I am an excellent medic and sensory ninja, she stated confidently. Very well, Shibuki said, and she returned to her seat, Jugo no Tenpin, come forth and present yourself. The orange-haired giant stepped forward and removed his hood. Did anyone invite you to this village? Shibuki inquired. Yes, Uzumaki Naruto, he meekly replied. What brings you here? He inquired. I have a power within me that I am unable to control, and it has manifested itself as a split personality. I would like assistance in controlling this power. Do you want to control this power or seal it away? Fuma Hanzaki asked, turning Jugo's head in the direction of the unfamiliar voice. It doesn't matter, as long as I'm not tormented by it. Do you really believe you're the source of Orochimaru's curse seals? Yes, he said, tears welling up in his eyes as he realized what that meant. What can you say for yourself? I have no excuse for what was done with my blood or for willingly surrendering myself to Orochimaru, he said, eliciting murmurs in the shadows, but I had no choice because he was the only one who could contain me because I was a danger to everyone around me. Aside from your unique metamorphic abilities, what do you bring to this village? I have limited communication skills with animals. Very well, you may take your seat, Shibuki continued, Hazuka Suigetsu, please come forward and present yourself. The shark-toothed boy stood up and took off his hood. Did anyone invite you to this village? That Naruto guy, he confirmed. You will respect Uzumaki-sama, Tsubaki said calmly, yet coldly. Suigetsu was immediately intimidated by several murderous intents directed at him. Please accept my apologies, he said, a toothy grin on his face and beads of sweat on his brow. Can you tell me why you're here? To obtain the seven swords of the mist that you have in your possession. Why do you want those weapons? Riku inquired. Because wielding them is my destiny. What are you going to do to get one? I don't want one, I want them all, and I'm going to get them all by defeating all of my great senpais. What talent do you have that could benefit this great village? Shibuki inquired. I am an assassin who cannot be hurt with ordinary means. What do you mean? Shibuki inquired. He simply converted an arm to water, causing it to swirl around before reforming into his arms. Very well, he said before calling the next person, Suk and Akira, come forth and present yourself. She stood up, and for added effect, as she raised her hood, she let her hair cascade down her back, changing its color from green to purple. She achieved her goal, with murmurs coming from the shadowed members of the audience. Did anyone invite you to this village? Yes, by my adorable younger brother, Naruto-kun. Can you prove that you were descended from Shodai Kanshisha? Just ask him, she said, we may not be blood relatives, but we couldn't be any closer. Do you agree with her claims, Kanshisha-sama? Yes, Naruto said, she is a sister in every way except blood to both me and Hanada, Naruto smiled, and then continued, she was always there and even saved my life. There is no reason to question you any longer, Akira-san. However, for the sake of procedure, I must ask one final question. What talent do you have that could benefit this great village? Among other things, I have a rare bloodline that allows me to change my body into almost any form. Very well, you may take your seat, he said, motioning for Uchiha Itachi to come forward and present himself. When this name was mentioned, 
everyone at the center of the table let out a loud gasp. They all made a point of checking to see if it was true. Karen instinctively felt great fear as he stood up and smoothly removed his mask and hood. She'd heard about him slaughtering his entire clan except Sasuke, the most powerful clan of ninja in the world except the Senju. How could she have sat next to a monster and not realized it? Was he also a member of this village? Uchiha Itachi, your deeds are grave, and you are a notorious S-class criminal, Shibuki said. Who invited you to this village? I was invited by Shodai Kanshisha, Uzumaki Naruto-sama, he said, but I'm not sure why I was given this honor. Would Kanshisha-sama mind explaining? It is well known that Uchiha Itachi slaughtered the Uchiha clan, but what is not well known is that he did not do it alone, or the circumstances behind it, Naruto said, not revealing too much detail, however, when he attempted to capture me, I discovered those reasons, and due to the circumstances, I cannot tell right now, but I can say this, along with being a very powerful and strong ninja, he is the most loyal person I. Very well, because the council already knows the details, we'll move on, Hanzaki said, but why are you here? I have nowhere else that will accept me so openly, and I have the chance to start over and break the curse that is the Uchiha clan. What skill do you have that could be useful to the Great Storm Village? He only said, I have the Sharingan as well as years of experience as one of Konoha's top Anbu. Alright, take your seat, Itachi said, we'll take a 10 minute break while we discuss your fates. Please keep quiet during this time. Tsunade sat in her office, her gaze drawn to the small toad on her desk. He wasn't small in the traditional sense. After all, how many toads could talk? He sat on a chair that was held up by a four-legged toad. Fukasaku-sama, one of Mayobokuzan's great sages, had come bearing terrible news as well as a glimmer of hope. The man captured by Jiraiya was sent to the torture and interrogation department, and the body of pain was being examined by Shizun, but the image of the numbers carved into Fukasaku Baksamas, possibly the most important piece of information, was proving impossible to decipher. The cryptography division had been trampled. They had assumed that the key belonged to someone close to Jiraiya and had shown it to Tsunade and Kakashi, the two closest people left in the village to Jiraiya but they saw nothing familiar or remotely interesting about it. As a result, the elder Toad found himself in Tsunade's office. Did Jiraiya have another apprentice or student? Tsunade-chan inquired. Now that you bring it up, she began, propping her head on her fists, there was one, but I'm not sure how long he taught him. It makes no difference how long a master spends with his student, he said. What matters is the bond they shared. Well, they did have an interesting relationship. He even taught the brat Rasengan and let him sign the toad contract, Tsunade smiled, but there's a problem. Oh? He inquired. He is no longer in this village, she explained, smiling again, he has founded his own village, so getting him to come or go to him would take far too long and time, and time is of the essence. Not a problem, Tsunade-chan. He has signed the toad contract, the toad said, hopping off his chair and performing a series of hand seals before slapping his hands on the ground. It was the longest ten minutes of their lives, especially for Karen and Jugo, who were almost out of options. It didn't matter to Suigetsu. If they didn't accept him, he'd find another way to get the swords, but Itachi and Akira seemed to already know the outcome. Itachi remained serenely calm, while Akira smiled as if she could see through the darkness. Then the moment arrived. The verdict has been cast. Stand when you hear your name, Megan Tosuke said from behind the veil of shadows. Karen. She stood up a little too quickly. Your motives are honorable, and with enough training, you could be a most skilled ninja. However, you were a loyal lieutenant of a most disgusting criminal. 
Your verdict. Her breath caught in her throat, accepted, but you must serve three months probation. Jugo no Tenpin. Your motivations are very honorable, and with proper control, you will become a great ninja. Your verdict. Jugo had never felt more nervous, accepted, the same probation applies. Jugo's eyes welled up with tears as he realized that those were the most beautiful words ever spoken to him, even the probation. He was never told he was accepted, not even because of his power. Suigetsu, this was a difficult decision. However, your reputation precedes you. Another voice cut Megan off before he could continue. Wait, said another, what is your other motive? Suigetsu became nervous for the first time. He felt at his hip for his water, but forgot that it had been confiscated along with his normal clothes and weapon. He recognized the voice as that of the woman who had used his body to her advantage. That sweet but firm voice was one he'd never forget. Other motive? He asked, his face flushed, I only want the do not dare to lie to us, she said calmly, we are the ones who control your fate right now, so I would advise you to be very forthcoming with us. Fine, he said, there is a woman in this village, perhaps in this room, who can control my body. I want to know who that person is, and possibly defeat that person. Does this person frighten you? Another person inquired. Suigetsu froze. To be honest, he was terrified, not scared. What he once thought was his greatest advantage turned out to be completely useless, and he was literally bent to the will of another person. So he lowered his head and croaked out a barely audible response. What was it, and could you please speak louder? Are you satisfied? He exclaimed. I am terrified of this person, and if given the opportunity, I will kill that person with my own hands. As the council fell into hushed whispers, Karen shook her head, as if she already knew he was out. Very well, we have reached an agreement on your verdict, Suigetsu simply stood there without looking up, accepted. He wanted to know why he was accepted. He had just told them he wanted to kill a member of their village, and he was certain they knew he was referring to someone in this room, but before he could say anything, the voice moved on to Akira. You're Sukan Akira. No, Akira interrupted, even as Suigetsu looked at the woman with wide eyes. What? Said Naruto, do you not want to join this village? That is not what I meant, she clarified after hearing silence, I meant that I will no longer be known as Sukan Akira, but as Uzumaki Akira, if the current clan head accepts me. Very well, said the voice, pausing for a moment before continuing, Uzumaki Akira, due to pre-existing relationships with members of this village, you do not require a verdict as you have already been accepted. However, if you prove disloyal in any way, your relations will be forced to pay the price. Akira flashed a triumphant smile to Jugo, who only rolled his eyes at the girl's antics. Finally, Uchiha Itachi, a slight murmur went up, accepted. Karen was perplexed as to why he had been accepted so easily, especially without explanation. She kept her thoughts to herself. It was never a good idea to question one's superiors. She was about to ask if they were leaving when the lights suddenly came on, temporarily blinding her and bringing her out of her musings. The one in the center, whom she recognized as Naruto, was the first to speak. Please allow me to be the first to greet you. And with that, he vanished in a puff of smoke. Naruto-kun, Hanada exclaimed, stunned. Tsubaki bolted to the door and stood in front of it as soon as he saw this. Despite the fact that the door would not open unless all members were present, her instincts drove her actions. What in the world just happened? Suigetsu inquired. Did he just abandon us? No, Tsubaki replied, this is a serious matter, and no one will leave this room until we get to the bottom of it. 
no one argued. After all, in cases like this, the Reizoku clan's representative, Tsubaki, is responsible for the protection of any Uzumaki in their care. This was due to the blood pact between their clans and something that one of the Reizoku clan elders insisted on. Naruto knew that this could lead to a possible usurpation of power, so he made it very clear that the Uzumaki would choose who would be their right hand. Can you, Hanada-sama? Hanada had her Byakugan activated before the words had even left her mouth, seeing for miles in every direction and analyzing everything she could. I don't see any traces of him, nor are there any suspicious movements or items, but I do have a theory, says the investigator. Then a light appeared above Akira's head. He was summoned, she explained, but who could summon him? The village hidden in the said Naruto as he appeared in a puff of smoke, only to find himself next to an elderly toad wrapped in a cloak riding another toad-like royalty. He looked around, frantically bracing himself for any form of danger, until his gaze fell on a solemn-looking Tsunade. He jumped out of his chair. So this was Jiraiya Apprentice, Chan's the toad said, his smile quickly disappearing as if he sensed something, what is the meaning of this Tsunade? Tsunade no Ba Chan, how the hell did I get here? Naruto wondered, adding, and who is this Gama Jiji, and why does he refer to Aero Senen like a child? I was in the midst of a crucial meeting. Tsunade groaned. I apologize, Naruto-kun, but I believe this is far more important and directly concerns you. Naruto's face lit up as she said this, and he returned to his seat. Alright, I'm listening. As of two days ago, Jiraiya was killed in battle against the head of Akatsuki, Tsunade observed Naruto's surprised and saddened expression, then continued, he was able to capture one of his opponents as well as someone who is currently being interrogated by Inoichi. Naruto took a deep breath and exhaled heavily, as if the entire world was pressing against him. I see, he said, his eyes filled with sadness. And to answer your other questions, this is Fukasaku-sama, one of Myobokuzan's great sages who taught Jiraiya Senjutsu. When Naruto turned to greet the toad, all he saw was a green fist slamming into his face and embedding him into the wall. Tsunade-chan, this boy is not what he seems, the toad said as Naruto drew himself out of the wall and glared at him. With wind, he was able to deflect my punch. And it's a good thing I did, because you crazy Gama Gigi could have killed me. I thought they were all dead, but it appears that one survived, the toad said as he prepared for another assault, but before I finish you off, who trained you? What do you mean, Jiraiya trained me? Naruto defended. Don't play silly with me, boy, the toad snarled, I'm aware of the ancient order of shinobi. If the widening of his eyes was any indication, this caught Naruto completely off guard. How did you find out about them, and why do you seem to despise the order so much? When the toad saw Naruto's puzzled expression, he relented. Don't you know anything about the history of the ancient order of shinobi, or how you got your ability to bend the wind to your will? Don't be surprised, boy. I can sense such things a mile away, Naruto said, his eyes widening once more. How do you know about the order? Naruto inquired. The toad gave a thoughtful look, then sighed, realizing that the boy was completely unaware of the situation. You appear to be in the dark. In that case, allow me to educate you, he said to Tsunade, you listen to Tsunade-chan. Hello, Fukasaku-sama, Tsunade said, still stunned by Naruto's ability to bend an element. I'm sure you're all aware of how ninja first learned ninjutsu. Yes, Tsunade confirmed, it was because of the Rakuto Senen's teachings. Correct, but what you don't know is how he learned of it, he lectured, before ninja learned how to use chakra, they were pretty much like they are now, warring, fighting, killing each other, 
and hiring out their services to whomever. There was an organization known only as the Order of Shinobi among all these ninja. This organization was similar to a ninja clan, though they were not all related by blood, but by a strict code to which they all adhered and was led by a council. This organization was so powerful that their very existence was shrouded in mystery, and only the most powerful of lords could hire them, and they never failed or lost a ninja. They trained their ninja to the point where, while not capable of fighting a modern-day Jonin, their genin could easily defeat him if his guard is down. So far, what you've said appears to be correct, but how did you learn so much about them? Naruto inquired. Because, like all ninja of the time, they were greedy and lusted after power, and as a result, they got it from the only available source. Demons? Tsunade inquired. No, the summons, he said, drawing a gasp from both Naruto and Tsunade, summons often bestow certain gifts upon the wielders of their contracts, but unlike all summons, we, the Toads, mastered the use of chakra centuries before the Rakuto Senen bestowed it upon the ninja world through his teachings. After that, the Toad smiled. I thought you didn't like the Shinobi order, but you're smiling, Naruto inquired, puzzled. Well, I don't truly hate them. After all, how can a warrior truly hold a grudge against another who has proven his strength? He explained, seeing the still puzzled expressions on Naruto and Tsunade's faces, they were not only able to find Myobokuzen, a place where no one can find unless knowing the hidden passage, but they were able to steal the secret to Chakra and escape. I must admit that I have some resentment for them. I see, Tsunade said, but where does the Rakuto Senen fit in? He was one of them, a member of the Shinobi Order, the Toad explained, and when he appeared in the world, that was how we Toads knew they were able to decipher the secrets, but also how they did not fully unlock all of the secrets. A grandfatherly smile crossed the Toad's face as he looked at Tsunade and then at Naruto. One thing that still puzzles me, Naruto said, is how you knew I was one of their members. I could have created a wind buffer between us with Jutsu. That is correct, but I can feel the natural energy swirling around you. Harnessing natural energy is the last and most dangerous part of mastering chakra, the toad said, his amazement visible on his face. It is still incomplete, but to think that the order was able to reach this far is incredible. Even Rakuto Senen couldn't do what you're doing right now. I can see why Jiraiya Chan chose you now. As he said this, a Chunin entered the office. Tsunade Sama, she began, the Arashi team has arrived. She immediately bowed her head when she realized she had walked in during an important meeting. Please forgive me, Tsunade Sama, she said, but the toad's old voice stopped her before she could walk out. Tsunade nodded, allowing Chunin to continue. The Arashi team that was supposed to bring Sasuke has just arrived, but they don't appear to be carrying anything. Tsunade turned to face Naruto, who smiled. Where have they gone? Tsunade inquired. The team leader requested to be escorted to the hospital, so they are currently on their way there, he explained. This can't be one of your jokes, Naruto, Tsunade said. I assure you, it isn't, Naruto said with a grin that made Tsunade wonder, it is simply. Actually, let us go meet them, I am sure you would like to see this, it's a creation of Aero Senen and I. Tsunade raised an eyebrow before standing up and walking towards the door, Naruto close behind her. Are you on your way, Fukasaku-sama? Tsunade inquired, grasping the handle. No. I need to think about something first. I need to ask you a question when you return, Naruto-kun. Naruto and Tsunade then left the office. They found themselves in the hospital lobby moments later. When the three-man team entered through the main entrance and saw Naruto and Tsunade standing in front of them, they immediately bowed. We didn't expect to see you so soon, Kanshisha-sama, the team leader commented, 
How did you get here so quickly? I'd like to know that myself. Naruto murmured to himself, then said aloud, You may rise, Hotaru-san. I'm sure your journey was uneventful? Hotaru was a newer ninja to the Storm Village. When she received this mission, she felt like she was finally being recognized as more than a captured enemy ninja. However, when she learned that the mission was S rank, she was taken aback by the amount of trust being placed in her despite the fact that she was recognized as a Chunin level ninja and that the mission itself was almost foolproof, but the sensitivity and importance of the mission itself made it S rank. Mataza, she was certain, had persuaded Kanshisha to take such a risk on her. Mataza loved her, and she hated the ground he walked on at first. After all, he had nearly killed her when Iwa invaded, and he had single-handedly wiped out her squad with a single technique, and she had survived only by chance. She awoke to find him by his bed, apologizing profusely. Slowly but steadily, he melted her heart, and she soon swore her allegiance to the storm. However, something inside her changed when she received this mission. She would have been a loyal ninja like any other, but receiving this kind of mission as a new recruit on probation from a once enemy village increased her opinion of Mataza and Naruto a hundredfold. She would never leave Mataza's side again, and she would serve the Kanshisha to the point where her own life would be worthless. Yes, Kanshisha-sama, Hotaru replied, and I am now going about my business. Please excuse me. Of course, he replied, I promised Hokage Dono that she would see the Jutsu Jiraiya Sensei and I created, and did you find a suitable room? Not yet, she replied. I see, he observed, do you have a pen and paper? Naruto quickly scribbled some lines and figures on the blank scroll after the team leader produced a pen in a blank scroll. Tsunade no Ba-chan, is there a room with these exact dimensions in this hospital? Tsunade examined it before transporting them to a wing of the hospital used to house dangerous criminals who required treatment following more. Invasive interrogation methods are criminals who had to be brought down extremely hard. Naruto entered one of the rooms and nodded to his ninja, indicating that it was appropriate. Naruto shut the door, and the ninja approached it, pulling a scroll from her pouch and unsealing a brush, ink, a small vial of blood, and another scroll. She carefully unrolled the scroll and examined it before dipping the brush into the ink and writing, one, on the door with several runes surrounding it. She set the brush down before opening the vial of blood and smearing it across the seal she had just written on the door. She then went through a series of seals that Tsunade recognized as part of the summoning technique. Kachiyose no Jutsu, Hotaru said, pressing her hands against the door, it's done, I'll return to the storm right away. Very well, Naruto said, turning to Tsunade who had tentatively opened the door only to gasp when she saw Uchiha Sasuke laying on a bed with a paper seal planted on his forehead, do you like the technique? How did you do it? She wondered. This room looked nothing like it did before. There's no way that was just some simple summoning technique. You're right, Naruto said, it's a mix of sealing and summoning. I use it to transport dangerous or fragile people or items, as well as to seal away anything too dangerous or valuable where other security measures are insufficient. Tsunade inquired, how does it work? When the door closes, the entire room is sealed away in a pocket dimension, so when it is opened again, all that remains are the walls of an empty room. To retrieve the room, a summoning is required, and there is even a contract that must be signed in blood. The contract itself is locked away in one of the rooms, and only a select few have signed it. The ninja who had just summoned the room was granted temporary access, allowing her to summon only one specific thing and only once. I guess that's something only a pervert could think of, Tsunade said, tears welling up in his eyes, I guess I should get someone to move him now. You know, Tsunade no Ba-chan. That seal on the door prevents the room from returning for three days, and Sasuke will remain asleep as long as that seal remains on his head, 
So I'll wait for you outside, Naruto said softly. Tsunade nodded, and Naruto walked away. Tsunade turned around to check her surroundings, and when she was sure there was no one around her, she slammed her fist into the wall and wept silently for Jiraiya, just as she had silently wept for her dead brother and lover, as memories of Jiraiya assaulted her grieving mind. You idiot, idiot man. Tsunade emerged from the wing after a few moments to find Naruto waiting for her. She summoned a pair of Anbu and gave orders before approaching Naruto and whispering to him quietly because she knew the walls had ears. What about Danzo? She asked quietly. Naruto returned to the wing, nodding his head. Because it was a prisoner wing, there were few medics and only Anbu. Naruto entered a room and opened the door to inspect it. He closed it and turned to Tsunade after finding it satisfactory. Because his followers knew he was still alive, we had no choice but to keep him in one of these rooms, he said quietly, Kachiyose no Jutsu. Naruto turned the handle and paused when the summoning seal vanished from the door. Be ready, he advised. Tsunade gasped when he completely opened the door. Danzo was naked in a bare room, kneeling on the ground with one hand encased in a stone and iron glove bound behind his back with straps that held the appendage firmly to his back while connecting to his neck and also to his feet to bind them together as well as bind them to the floor. Anyone looking at his closed right eye could tell there was no eye behind the lids because there was a seal around his stomp of a shoulder. Finally, he had a suppressing seal on his forehead, similar to Sasuke's, to suppress his consciousness, and another on his stomach to suppress his chakra. Tsunade fixed his gaze on the once proud council member. She was perplexed. Yes, Danzo was an underhanded, no good, two-timing bastard that even Orochimaru was wary of, but despite his many transgressions, most of which bordered on treason, he did them all in his own way for the betterment of Konoha. I understand you don't like him, but was it really necessary to remove his hand and eye? Tsunade inquired. Yes, Naruto stated flatly, and as Tsunade waited for more, he elaborated, this man is by far the most dangerous person in the ninja world. His right eye was removed due to the Sharingan he implanted there, and his right hand was removed in battle against one of my dragons. Luckily, it was entirely covered in Sharingan and had another DNA implanted in it, according to Hanada's analysis. Due to the effects of the chakra that cut off his arm, the seal around the stomp is all that keeps him alive. When Tsunade heard that, her eyes widened. Where is the arm? She inquired, I'd like to compare DNA to see whose it is. Do you have a feeling? I can organize for you to do an analysis, Naruto asked, to which she nodded, but I will only allow Shizune or Sakura. That's fine, she said, turning back to Danzo and asking, can I speak to him? Naruto removed the seal from Danzo's forehead without saying anything, and his eyes shot open. He assessed his situation first, then his surroundings, before settling his half-closed gaze on Tsunade and Naruto. How are your accommodations, Danzo? Tsunade inquired. He didn't respond. I see you're not in the mood to speak, Naruto observed, but it doesn't matter because your foolish and misguided ambition has finally come to an end. Root is no longer in existence. He raised his head and looked defiantly into Naruto and Tsunade's eyes in response. When he only had one, it was quite a feat. Root is more than just me, boy. Root will continue and, one day, restore Konoha to its former glory. Naruto burst out laughing. Laugh now, but who will be laughing when this is all over? Tsunade addressed Danzo while still reeling from laughter. You don't understand, Danzo, we have already routed every single one of your hideouts, apprehended all your agents, and they are currently undergoing rehabilitation, she added, and then added, and for the record, Root was never about Konoha, it was always about you. 
Every one of your agents we questioned said the same thing, and none of it had anything to do with Konoha, only you. You are a tyrant who wishes to usher Konoha and the ninja world into an era of never-ending darkness, bloodshed, and darkness. When we have extracted all of the information from your living body, I will personally extract the remainder from your corpse. After she said that, Danzo did something that many people thought was impossible for him to do, he smiled. Not a happy grin, but one of defiance, as if he'd won some kind of martyr's trophy. You surprise me, Hokage-sama, Danzo said, because I always thought you were the most pitiful Hokage to date. Tsunade snarled and was about to sever his head when a paper seal flew past her and slapped Danzo's brow, lulling his head forward as his consciousness was once again locked away. And that is why we have him in such confinement, Naruto explained, because if you had kept going, you would have killed him and we would not have gotten any information out of him. Tsunade huffed and walked out of the room before Naruto, who closed the door behind him, allowing Danzo to return to where he was kept. Perhaps that isn't such a bad trade-off. Hey, how much longer must we stay in here? Exclaimed Suigetsu. Be quiet, Suigetsu, can't you see that this is probably a procedure in case something like this happens? Karen said quietly to Suigetsu, from what I can tell, the woman who is always by Naruto's side is in charge in this situation. You're quite astute, Naruto-san. Sama made an excellent decision in including you in our ranks, a voice from behind her said, causing Karen and Suigetsu to sigh, but you are not exactly correct. Fourteen people entered this room alive, and no one will be allowed to leave unless there are fourteen living people in this room, as the door is sealed. As he spoke, a small gust of wind formed into a vortex, and Naruto, a small toad, Tsunade, and Shizun emerged from the vortex. I apologize for leaving so abruptly, Naruto said, but it appears that the toad contract also allows the toads to summon me. So, what did I miss? Shizun couldn't help but gasp when she saw Uchiha Itachi, one of Konoha's most infamous missing ninja, but she kept her cool and waited until she was in a private location to relay her concerns to Tsunade. When the meeting was finished, the counselors left, leaving the department heads, Naruto, the new ninja, and those who came with him to follow Naruto to his office. He came to a halt as he approached his office. Many important things have occurred recently, Naruto stated, and Hanada immediately recognized that something was deeply troubling him, please wait here and tell. Wait, Naruto, the Hokage said, what we need to discuss will take the rest of the day, as I am sure Fukasaku-sama has a lot to talk about with you. Hum, I see, he said, then why don't you, Shizun Nei chan and Gama Gigi wait in the lounge, you'll be quite comfortable, and I won't take long. Please follow me into my office, everyone else. As Naruto said this, a ninja appeared and escorted Tsunade and company to the lounge, while Naruto and the other went into his office, where Naruto quickly took his seat behind his desk, with Hanada, Tsubaki, Riku, Mika, and Kai standing behind him. The ninja system of this village is divided into five departments. Assassination, Suigetsu smiled, then glared at Hanada, Hunter, Intelligence, Medic, and General or Free Response Ninja, and then there are the Jiryu no Urashi, the elite of the elites and embodiment of the will of the storm. He then indicated the ninja standing behind him by waving his hands. These outstanding people standing behind me are the heads of these departments. I will not tell you their names or which department they lead, Naruto said to the assembled ninja, Suigetsu, Karen, and Jugo, you have all been given the rank of Chunin, and Itachi and Akira, you have both been given the rank of Special Jonin. Does this mean we'll be assigned to a department now? Karen inquired. No, Naruto replied, you can choose any department except Jiryu no Urashi. However, you must make an informed decision because you can only change your mind once, and no department is easier than the others. Now, Karen and Suigetsu must make a decision. 
Suigetsu was the first to make a decision because he had known what he wanted to be for years. I chose assassination, he said, a toothy grin on his face. I chose, Karen thought hard, because her abilities allowed her to fit in as either a medic or a hunter, so she chose, hunter. She would have been fine as a medic, but she had a gift that she would not waste, and being a hunter nin couldn't possibly be that difficult with her skills as a medic. Just wait until she enters the first week of hell. If she survives, she will be a true hunter. Then it was Jugo's turn. I choose, he began, but Naruto cut him off. Wait. Jugo, given your circumstances, I will deal with you personally, he said before turning to Akira and Itachi, Uchiha Itachi, you have been chosen for the final spot of the Jiryu no Urashi, do you accept? I serve with humility and honor, Itachi said. You are the tenth dragon, then. In private, you only answer to me, and your only equals are the department captains and the other dragons, Naruto explained. As for you, Akira, do you remember what we agreed on? Sure. Why not, but why wasn't I chosen for the Jiryu no Urashi? She sighed, it's not that I'm weak. Master said my training was finished and that I could even take you for a while if you don't use the Kyubi's chakra. Hanada laughed as Naruto laughed at his sister's antics. Well, if you don't want to be the head of the intelligence division, I can always find someone else. Wait, I was just kidding, she quickly corrected herself, that would be fine. Naruto then rose from his seat and followed the five new ninja. Well, now that you've all chosen your path, allow me to introduce to you the captains of the departments, he began, from left, we have Mika, head of the medic department, followed by Hayuga Hanada, head of the assassination department. They bowed as he said their names, but Suigetsu was wide-eyed and pale as he realized who would be his commander for the rest of his life. He couldn't believe his good fortune, or lack thereof. Naruto was aware of his predicament but continued regardless. Next up is Hagen Riku, the Jiryu no Urashi's head. Reizoku Tsubaki, the Jonin commander of the general ninja squads, stands next to him. Then there's Kuga Kai, head of the hunter department, and finally, we have the newly appointed Uzumaki Akira, head of the intelligence department, he finished, turning around to gauge their expressions, any questions. Isn't that the blind Nodashi, Hagen Riku, master of the silent killing technique? And when do we start? Suigetsu inquired. Yes, I am, Riku confirmed, and I will keep an eye on you, second coming of the devil Momochi. Suigetsu responded with a toothy grin. And to answer your questions, you will all begin tomorrow, Naruto said. If you have any further questions, Kai-san will direct you to suitable accommodations. Please accompany me, Hanada-chan. Akira Ne, and Hagen Riku. Naruto then left the three he had summoned, as well as Tsubaki, and appeared in the lounge with Tsunade, Shizune, and Fukasaku-sama. I apologize for keeping you waiting, Naruto said, but please allow me to introduce you to the other two students of the ancient shinobi order, my wife, Hayuga Hanada, and my sister, Uzumaki Akira. Tsunade and Shizune's eyes widened when he mentioned having a sister, but they decided to save that for later. Meanwhile, the toad was assessing the two as if they were valuable works of art for sale. Akira was about to confront Naruto about revealing the source of their power when he was interrupted by a raised hand. I can tell that these two are order products, he sighed, and I have made a decision. From now on, I would like to train you. Naruto was stunned and skeptical. He remembered what the toad had told him about the origin of chakra, but he still couldn't wrap his head around it. This is a great honor, Tsunade said, explaining that Fukasaku-sama was the one who taught Jiraiya the sage art. I understand that, and I appreciate the offer, Naruto said, surprising the others in the room, but I am the leader of this village, and I have many responsibilities, so I cannot just leave it, and if Akatsuki come looking for me, 
They will not hesitate to lay waste to everything in sight, so I must decline your offer. As he smiled, the toad showed greater respect for Naruto. Then Hinata spoke up. I believe you should leave, Naruto-kun. But who would watch over the village? You have built a village, gathered clans and warriors and given them a reason to fight and live for, fought Orochimaru, brought back Sasuke, defeated not one, but two invasions, foiled countless spies, and defeated two traitors, not just from here, but from Konoha, and formed an alliance. All this in only one year, she concluded, kissing him on the lips and continuing softly, go and do what you must, let us show you that you have built a village that can take care of itself, even if our Kanshisha is not here. Naruto grinned. Thank you, Sukihana. You always know just what to say, he said. He then turned to look at the toad, I guess you've got a new student, Gama Gigi. The toad smiled, but it was cut short when Naruto heard someone clearing their throat. When he turned to see who it was, his gaze was drawn to Akira. Naruto, aren't you forgetting something? Though you have accepted the toad's offer, Akira said with a kunoichi air, we three must return to Master's side tomorrow, before it is too late. As sadness frosted over Naruto's eyes, this seemed to bring him back down. Of course, Akira nay, he admitted, but do you think I, of all people, would forget? Naruto stood up and exited the room with Tsubaki, but he paused before closing the door. Forgive me, Hokage Dono, Fukasaku-sama, but there are things I must attend to, he said as he turned, and Hanada-chan and accommodate you in any way possible, and Akira nay chan your new subordinates are waiting for you. He walked away, and the door closed quietly behind him. Akira looked at the door, saddened. She knew Naruto was close to Master Kiyosh, much closer than she or Hanada were, but she didn't expect the pain to be so intense in only two days. She, too, was heartbroken, but at least she knew he wasn't dead yet. So, what was the deal with him? Her obsession was to know everything, and not knowing bothered her, but when her family hurt and she didn't know why, it tore her apart. Hanada turned to face Akira and, as if sensing her thoughts, responded. Jiraiya-sama has died, she lamented, and Akira gasped. What? She exclaimed, stunned. Oh my god, I had no idea. If only I could. When Hanada's hand rested on her shoulder, she was cut off. It's okay, Nei-chan, Hanada said, Naruto is strong, he's just overwhelmed right now, after all, it's not every day that you lose someone close to you or know when another will leave. I suppose all we can do is be there for him, she sighed, nodding, now, how do I find my department? Would you mind showing Akira Nei to her subordinates, Riku-san? Of course not, Hanada-sama, he said as he led a solemn Akira out the door. Hanada made a gentle gesture to the remaining guests in the room after they had left. I apologize for this, but tomorrow would not be a good time for Naruto to begin his training under you, Fukasaku-sama, Hanada explained, I hope you understand. Not a problem, child, he said calmly, I will summon him in two days. He made a hand seal and vanished in a puff of smoke with that. I hope I'm not being rude, Shizun said, but what was all that about? Tsunade glared at the brunette who eeped and tried to shrink herself when she realized she had spoken out of turn. Hanada, on the other hand, smiled at the two. I'm not at liberty to go into specifics, but tomorrow, Naruto-kun, Akira-chan, and I would have to pay a visit to our master to receive his final wishes and for him to choose the next leader of the ancient order of the shinobi. So that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel for more awesome stories like this. Thank you. See you all in my next video.